Art Center. I think I'll give you a little personal history before I tell you about him. I first saw Mike's cloud, Mike, <laughs> Mike's work, um, when I was visiting a collector in Baltimore doing research for another project. And this collector was so excited to show me the piece that they had by Mike. And not only was his enthusiasm contagious, but the work was so strong, it just stuck in my mind. And I really became interested. I started looking up his work and following what he was doing. And um, then a few months later, I was in New York, and he happened to be having a show in his gallery, Thomas Urban. And I came upon that show, and things just seemed to coalesce. I then was moved to San Francisco, and Mike did a residency out in the Bay Area, and unfortunately, we missed each other out there, but our paths just seemed to be converging. So eventually, when I got out here to Washington, D.C., I took a trip up to New York and finally got to meet Mike and do a studio visit with him. And he graciously agreed to do a show with us here, and this is the conclusion of that story, but hopefully just the beginning of our relationship. So Mike currently lives in Brooklyn and teaches at Brooklyn College, though just told me today he is moving to Chicago and will become a professor at the School of the Art Institute of Chicago, my alma mater, so that's very exciting to me. Um, he holds an MFA from Yale University and a BFA from the University of Illinois, Chicago. His work has been exhibited nationally and internationally, including at PS1 in New York and the Studio Museum in Harlem, most recently at the Riva and David Logan Center for the Arts at the University of Chicago. Um, he's included in a number of prestigious collections, museum collections and private collections, including the Bronx Museum, the Lincoln Center, and Metropolitan Museum of Art. He's been reviewed and had his own writing published in a number of periodicals. Just to name a couple, the New York Times, Art in America, and Art Forum recently about his show, most recently in Chicago. So we are very pleased to have Mike here. This is the first time, I believe, that your work has been shown in the DC area. So thank you very much. Mike is going to talk for around 20 minutes, and then we'll sit down and start the conversation and invite you all to join in as well. So please welcome Mike Cloud. Well, thank you guys. Um, <clears throat> so I think that uh, since I teach art at Brooklyn College, I end up talking about art a lot with students, like I teach graduate students and undergrads and all that. And sometimes we talk about, uh, well, I tell them that there are three things that are true about all the art in the world. All the art in the world is artificial, which means that art doesn't occur in nature, and it's the product of intentional fabrication by people. And all art has uh, symbolic meaning, uh, and all art is addressed to some audience. And when we talk, I tell them that our art is different from the art that you would see in the Met or some museum somewhere, in the sense that <clears throat> the audience our art is addressed to is actually us, like they're alive right now. So like the Mona Lisa was addressed to some audience at some point, but that audience is dead. And so part of the Mona Lisa we can never recover, right? There's some relationship that people back then could have had with it, that we'll never get back. Maybe art historians, to some degree, can recover it. Uh, but it's like sort of the idea that, you know, when they dig up dinosaurs, all they have are bones of the dinosaurs. The dinosaurs used to be animals like us. They used to have flesh and, and blood, and they used to eat things and poop and all that stuff. They used to be very different than they are when they're in the museum. And so the work that we make now is sort of like living dinosaurs, for better or worse. Like, you could like fossils better than living dinosaurs in some ways, because they're modular. Like, you can take a Tyrannosaurus skull and, like, have it in your living room or something. Uh, you know, they don't eat, they don't make a mess, they don't smell, and so forth. Uh, so I'll talk a little bit about the living part of the work, which is the part that is actually addressed 
to people in the world that I live in. Uh, there's other parts that will survive like 100 years from now, some hopefully, uh, my lips to God's ears. Uh, part of these paintings will still be there, right? But there's some parts that will be lost forever, the parts that are specifically addressed, right? Um, so I'll talk about some of those parts. With the shaped paintings, um, the, the, the basic idea that I was taught about um, abstraction is the idea that abstraction draws aesthetic energy, emotional energy, just from the work of the artist. So just from lining, staining, choosing, coloring, building, like that's where all the emotional energy of an abstract work comes from, rather than a representational work, which can draw energy from how you feel about stuff in the world. So like I could have a painting of a balloon or a puppy, and part of the emotional energy of that painting would come from feelings about the world, right? And so um, I wanted to kind of test the idea that all paintings necessarily have to be pictures of something. So they, uh, but you would say, oh, but wait a minute, what about a monochromatic blue painting? Like, that's not a picture of anything. And I would say, oh, it's actually a picture of a blue rectangle. But we've just been trained not to understand the rectangle as being the subject, right? We, we ignore the, the shape. And so I wanted to bring that out by shaping the painting as something that you wouldn't be able to ignore. Um, and so I put the rectangle inside of that shape and then uh, kind of point out the energy of that shaping. And even rectangular paintings have an emotional energy. I think rectangular paintings are about architecture in a way, like they're about the shape of walls. They're about a kind of victory of the, of the rectangle. The idea that we can move the rectangle from one place to another and it'll always fit because the rectangle dominates the world in a way. But all of that is kind of a hidden meaning of the rectangle because we've kind of forgotten it. So I wanted to bring that out. Um, with the collages, I wanted to make work that was responsive to other people's work. And I was thinking of, uh, of um, Georgia O'Keeffe specifically, right? But the problem is uh, I don't have her work, so like I can't respond to it because there's no way for me to possess it. But I thought that photographers were a better subject because you can actually have their work. So like if you buy a book of Annie Leibovitz's photography, that's her real work right there. Like those are her photographs. So uh, I wanted to see what was possible uh, when you kind of actually could physically possess another artist's work. And what I was doing was kind of transforming them to make them work the way paintings work which means bringing them into a single plane. Uh, books, you know, books, a codex, it kind of sits on a table and you flip the pages one at a time. So, so I wanted you to kind of encounter them all at once. And also what I did was I was looking for, um, there's an idea of a punctum. Like there's some part of a photograph which is a kind of focal point of the photograph. Uh, so I wanted to take all those focal points and spread them out to kind of flatten the photographs a bit. So I cut them all out, and I put them along the side there. And then I signed her name, and I dated it. So those were all kind of gestures of painting that I introduced into the work. There's also a color aid paper, which is sort of the bane of art school students, because it's something we use in a color theory class. Uh, I was failing a color theory class at Yale, and I had this uh, idea that I would somehow be able to use color aid paper in a way that was so moving that it would convince this professor to give me an A. Uh, it was sort of a tradition, like the graduate students would take this color theory class, and we would all drop it, because we were all going to fail. Uh, but me and another student, we decided we were going to stick it out. and. Uh, so I made this giant painting, covered in color painting, paper, 
and he failed me anyway, right? <laughs> but the paintings, um, the, I got my first solo show in New York, and it was reviewed in the New York Times by uh, Roberta Smith, and uh, so there. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a good thing I stayed in the class. <laughs> um, there are also the arrows, which are, again, just shaped paintings. But I was interested in the idea that, you know, uh, it's hard to make a 10 foot tall painting, a 20 foot tall painting, that isn't just about how awesome painting is, right? Uh, and I think that that's tied up into the victory of rectangles in a way. And I think that shaped paintings have allowed me to make these really huge abstract paintings which no one thinks are about how awesome painting is. Like, they, they know that it's about something in the room, right? That's another uh, kind of thing about painting and sculpture, is that paintings are often this kind of window on the wall that looks into some other world, right? But sculptures are always in the room with us. So, uh, so leaning the paintings against the wall rather than hanging them is a kind of way of cheating and bringing some of sculpture's presence into painting. And my excuse was that, uh, you know, works of art kind of have to live among their neighbors in a way. So architecture has to negotiate with like rivers and mountains and trees and stuff like that that kind of occupy the same space. And sculptures have to negotiate with like people and pets and furniture and things that kind of occupy that space. And painting has a kind of sacred space on the wall, because nothing lives on the wall other than mirrors, windows, doors, and other kinds of uh, metaphorical and literal portals. Uh, but I thought that, that what we give up from that sacred space is a kind of presence, right? Because of those, that idea of the portal and elsewhere. Um, so I thought that another kind of neighbor painting has is a shrine. So I was thinking if you go to a Chinese restaurant or something, and there's like a box, and it has a statue and oranges and incense, that that's another kind of engagement, both with the sacred space of the wall, but also with a kind of presence in a room. Uh, so that's why those leaning kind of became a strategy for me. Uh, hmm. Can I ask you to talk about the use of text in your work? Yeah, there's only one example of text here, okay. which is that painting. Um, text appears sometimes in other ways in the paintings. I try to use text in a painting in a way that pictures don't work um, as a kind of excuse in a way. Because as painters, you wouldn't want to use text because uh, a picture is worth a thousand words, something like that. Like it seems like a, a cop out or something to use text. So usually I would have an excuse like um, uh, once I made a painting that was a shopping list. So it said uh, green versus red apples, uh, white versus brown bread, uh, green versus black tea, let's say. And my excuse for having text in that painting is that picture language, uh, you can't negate things by including them. Like in a list, I can tell you don't buy uh, organic apples, and that means that organic apples are not on the list of things to buy, even though they're included on the list, right? That's something language can do, is I can negate by mentioning, right? Pictures can't do that. So that would be an excuse to use language in that painting. Like I have no choice because they do something that pictures can't do. Uh, I don't have such an excuse in that piece. Uh, this piece was made as a response to another piece I made. I made another piece that was a Confederate flag that was very Southern in its kind of aesthetics. And I wanted to make a piece that was Northern in its aesthetics. So this piece was like kind of the ideas about Broadway, about New York, uh, and just ideas about the North, progress, industrialism, stuff like that. And I thought that uh, 
when I was a kid, I used to see in art history books, they used to have a lot of, action, of rape paintings, like the rape of this and the rape of that. And the genre was basically guys trying to grab women. And the women, they didn't like consciously resist the men, but they just seemed incredibly slippery. Like they just couldn't grab a hold of these women. And uh, the myth is a kind of foundational myth. It's an idea of like, uh, you know, every kind of great thing being built upon some crime, right? And so that seemed like a very northern progressive idea to me. The idea of we have to move on. Like that's the idea of progress is like we have to keep going, right? Um, so I guess my excuse for using text in this piece I guess it's actually a weakness of painting, another weakness related to the shopping list weakness, which is that in normal spoken language, we have what we call pejoratives. A pejorative is something you can add to make something worse. So like I made a painting uh, that was called Blood Diamond, right? And it used diamond and pejoratives. So blood diamonds are worse than regular diamonds. Uh, and it would say like diamond-holic, diamond-centric, Diamondette, diamond side, and all these kind of pejoratives. So in picture language, you can't do that. You can't add to a painting in order to make it worse. So like I have a friend who's a painter, and he supposedly hates Renaissance paintings, right? So what he does to, to display his displeasure is he paints Renaissance paintings, and then he like puts an X over them or something. <laughs> but of course, I don't really believe him that he doesn't like Renaissance painting. Because 90% of his labor is making a Renaissance painting. Only a little tiny bit of his labor is negating it. But that's how picture language works, right? So how do I reference a painting? I, there's no way I'm gonna paint, you know, The Rape of the Save by Women, because I actually don't like it. Uh, so maybe text is like a way of, of, of negating in some way. Because the painting is not, abstract in the sense that it's all representational. Like that's brass, and those are bricks, and those are stairs, those are stars, those are cubes with tongues. So it's not like I don't like representing things. I just don't want to represent that. Right? So I guess uh, that's how text works in this painting, is uh, mentioning something while giving it the least amount of energy possible, perhaps. And the, the green text, there's a quote in uh, True Grit, uh, where, what's the star's name? The Duke? True Grit? John Wayne. John, John Wayne. Uh, he says the two things he doesn't believe are fairy tales and stories about money. And that also seemed like a very kind of American thing to me, is uh, our superstitious uh, relationship to money. Uh, yeah, so that's sort of where that quote came from, modifications. Should I start asking questions? Absolutely. Thank you. OK, so you obviously are very immersed in art history and in your teaching and in thinking of critically about painting and about how history is written and stories are told. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your relationship to being a teacher and how that comes into your studio practice. It seems that, well, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> Well, you know, there's practical issues. Uh, artists from other places in the world always remark to me how desirable teaching positions are to American artists. So even very famous American artists will teach. Because, uh, you know, in America, uh, health benefits, things like that, are often tied into working. So otherwise, I would have to do all that myself, uh, even above just selling a bunch of paintings and making a bunch of money or something. I would just be a pain. Uh, I've always taught, uh, I studied education, and I guess 
You know, a, a painter who was my teacher, he said to me, a uh, very famous abstract painter, he said, I feel a greater sense of continuity from teaching than I do just from being an artist in the world. Mm -hmm. What he meant was that in, at school, like Mel Bachner and Kende Wiley and uh, Peter Haley and Mickalene Thomas and whoever else will all be sitting in a room talking about a work of art, whereas those people would never be in the same cafe together because they're different sorts of people. So school, at this moment, its relationship to art is that it brings together people who are, who are from different classes and locations and so forth and gives them a reason to talk to each other about art, which would never happen in a purely kind of social milieu or something. Uh, and also, uh, school is a part of, a, you mentioned the word critical, uh, school is a part of the kind of myth of criticality. Uh, the idea that we don't just do things, but we think about the things we're doing. Uh, you know, know thyself, right? Uh, you, I think the, the opposite of know thyself would be be thyself. Just do whatever you feel like doing it and don't think about it. So uh, those are the two important things for me about school mm -hmm. is that they bring together people who have no social reason to be together and it uh, incorporates this ancient myth of criticality into the practice of art making. Because artists have not always uh, been critical. Uh, there was a time when artists did not exist to tell people what art was or you know whatever. Uh, society told them what art was, and they just were manufacturers of that thing, you know. Uh, and one day it will probably be like that again. Uh, but this is kind of an interesting moment to be in because of that idea of criticality. So, does that make you feel, this is just hearing you talk, there's something that sounds almost, you know, in the... Marxian way of being a worker, that you are an art worker, and part of that is being in the academy, and you go to do your labor, and then come back into the studio and continue the labor, um, which I hadn't really thought of before in terms of your work, but you build your canvases, you do you work with a studio assistant, so there's something that's very much seems to me about continuing this history of work in your practice as well. Yeah, I mean, I think people often, uh, critics will often remark of how physical the work is, right? Uh, the kind of painterly tradition that I work within abstractly is our ideas of gestural painting, gestural abstraction. Basically, it's the idea of like, you know, you could tell how fast somebody was walking by how far apart their footprints are. Uh, if I uh, work in a certain way through the painting, a lot of physical information is in the painting about how fast my arm moves, how close or how far I was, whether I painted from my wrist or from my elbow or from my shoulder or from my waist. And even though you don't consciously uh, register that information, it actually brings your body along with a, a bodily journey of mind. Uh, it's just like an animal thing, you know. Uh, yeah, so physicality is important. Mm -hmm. So then thinking about registering information, um, you talk a lot about the painting, the rectangle, the shapes, and expectations. Um, when you're approaching your shapes, are you really able to let go of symbolism, or is that something that is difficult for you too, even when you're so immersed in this practice? Well, I tend to use symbolic palettes. So like my palette would be red, white, and blue, or silver, gold, and bronze, or uh, pink and blue, something like that. So uh, something with symbolic meaning. 
Uh, with the uh, six pointed star, when I was a kid, they taught us that in concentration camps, people wore uh, stars of David that were color coded. And there were lots of different uh, codes for being a gypsy or being this or being that. But the two that I remembered were pink for being a sex criminal and yellow for being Jewish. And um, in color theory, let's say there's four primary colors. There's red, yellow, blue, and green. Red and yellow are special because if you add white to red, it becomes another color, it becomes pink. If you add black to yellow, it becomes another color, it becomes brown. Uh, green and blue don't change if you want light or dark, and it's just dark blue or light blue. And so sometimes yellow and red are thought to be feminine in a way because of their changeability, right? Uh, so I was interested in, I've done other paintings that show the interest more, but I was interested in uh, the transition of the pink uh, star to the pink triangle of gay pride and also to the rainbow flag and the idea of what color symbolize in those movements and also the yellow star to the blue star of Israel. And, uh, and, and how color theory and formalism and the Bauhaus and so forth are all tied up in a political narrative of, the, of World War II. Uh, you can often get an art history book and it'll be called Art Since 1945, 1945 being the end of World War II, and this kind of symbolic uh, end of European kind of parochialism. The idea that in the past, there was an Italian school of painting, uh, a Dutch school of painting, a French school of painting, and what defined those schools was, was kind of parochial subject matter, right? They would paint different stuff, and um, kind of an academicism. So there was a way you do it, and if you don't do it that way, then it's bad. And then uh, there's a movement away from that towards abstraction, which is meant to be universal and psychological. Uh, so all the art in the world, 90% of the art in the world for 20,000 years, has been abstract. And the idea is that the way you connect to this is not through your history or something, uh, but through your pure psychology. That's the idea of formalism. Formalism is the belief in a significant form. The idea that what's move, moving in a work of art are the lines, the shapes, the colors, et cetera, just the formal aspects, and they act directly on psychology. But I guess what I learned in school is that there are too many things in the world to believe them all, but you can understand them all. So like you can understand Greek mythology and Islamic mythology and Christian mythology, but you couldn't actually believe them all because they're mutually exclusive. Uh, so yeah. That makes me think about all of the different materials, let's say, that you use in your work and maybe this understanding to understand them all, that you've used clothes, you've used kids toys, you've used photography, um, it seems like, I think in all of your work, but there's something about this collecting and maybe this voracious curiosity or want to understand different parts of the world, um, but also thinking you are really, seem to define yourself as a painter but painters wouldn't necessarily try to understand these other, well, you make them your medium, but these other objects in the world as part of their artwork. Mm -hmm. Can you talk, I think probably a lot of people aren't familiar with your full practice, and unfortunately we don't have images, but you've done some quilts with clothing that you, attach to stretcher bars and do some painting um, with. You've used some recognizable children's games in some of your work. 
Yeah. Um, so you would probably recognize uh, the work even if you saw a bunch of things that were kind of in different ways. Uh, because I guess something that would, would follow through all of them is an interest in the exposure of a, of a skin or a film. So all of them are very like uh, skin-like or something like that. Uh, and I think that that is partially what defines a painting. Like the difference between um, a painted object, like the floor is painted, versus a painting on the floor, is I think that with a painting you can always imagine peeling it off, uh, even if you couldn't do it in real life. Like you can always imagine separating it from whatever its kind of support is. Uh, so that is probably my only rule to stay in the kind of genre of painting is this idea of uh, always being able to imagine separating it from, from whatever its support is. And other than that, maybe I'll paint on a, you know, a plastic cow or something like that. Uh, yeah. So, so. So these paper quilts, I believe you use the paint actually as the adhesive, which complicates that idea of the surface because the paint itself becomes a part of the surface. Um, but I think it was important to you to not use glue. But show, can you talk about why you made that decision to use paint? Well, um, I still had some color A paper left over from <laughs> grad school. And I always joke with my friends, uh, because it's kind of romantic that I use oil paint. And I always say that uh, acrylic paint just makes good glue, but it doesn't actually make good paint. And so I was using the acrylic paint as glue. And in all of this, nothing is really glued on top of anything. Everything is glued like that. So the way that you sew, kind of like with the seam, uh, and glued at the seam. Um, there's no intentional painting. All of the color you see is just the messiness of the process. So I'm just doing this by hand and, and smearing paint around by, by accident, uh, except for the signing. Um, it's not a painting. It's a collage. Uh, but it's just kind of following some of the rules of painting. One of my interests in photography is contemporary painters don't really uh, objectify people anymore. So like people, I, I'm not going to go to Tahiti and paint Tahitian women uh, because I'm not a Tahitian woman. So nowadays if you saw a painting of a Tahitian woman, it was probably a Tahitian woman who painted it. So painters usually, you might complain that we self-objectify rather than objectifying one another. But uh, in photography, they still you know, go do whatever. So they'll, they go to India and photograph prostitutes.